Well, good evening and welcome to Chosen People Ministries Tuesday Night Bible Study. Tonight, as we continue our journey through Genesis and Messianic prophecies, I'm going to look at an encounter between Hagar and the angel of the Lord. And I'm going to ask what we can learn from this story for ourselves and think about a little bit about the significance of her encounter with the angel of the Lord and ask why Paul in Galatians chapter four uses Hagar in his allegory and teaching. And hopefully we might see what Paul wants us to really get hold of. So let's begin with the encounter between Hagar and the angel of the Lord. First, a little bit of background. Sarah has followed her husband, Abraham. Abraham back in Genesis 12 has been given the promise. It's been ratified in previous chapter, in chapter 15. And in theory, Sarah trusts that his revelation of God is true and that what God has promised he will do. Unfortunately, poor old Sarah is a realist. And what she realizes is that she is beyond the age of conception. And so unable to bear children, she must resort to the ancient practice of surrogacy. We think surrogacy is a modern um, thing, but it's there in the Bible and it was a practice in the ancient Near East. And what happened was this, oh, the wife who is unable to bear a child will actually buy a slave and give it to her husband. And then if a child is born, it will, after it's been nursed and um, old enough, it will be taken from the slave woman and given to the wife and become the rightful heir. And this is Sarah's plan. In fact, we they've even come across um, in archaeology um, a really interesting, they came across something that said there was a covenant made. If I don't give you a child in ten within 10 years, you can get rid of me. And, and that includes by surrogacy, by the through the servant. But um, Sarah's plan didn't rest on the promise of God given to Abraham. Her plan was born out of her realism and what she saw as the facts of life and past childbearing. So she hatches a plan that will have consequences for the people who will be born as the people of God's promise. And it will have consequences for the children and the people that will be born from Hagar. And here's the truth that all plans born out of our desire to work things out instead of entrusting God will end up a mess. But here is the glorious thing. In the middle of our mess, in the middle of our mistakes, the grace of God turns up his mercy and his loving kindness, evident in the divine principle that James gives to us, that mercy triumphs over judgment. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah 9, verse 24, we read this, let him who boasts, boasts in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things. I think that's such an incredible uh, self-evident testimony that God gives him about himself. And I think it actually takes us back to his own declaration to Moses, when Moses asks to see his glory. And the Lord hides him in the cleft of his rock, of the rock, and the, the glory passes him by. And the, the Lord God declares who he is, a God of 
faithfulness, a God of loving kindness, a God who extends mercy to a thousand generations. So here we have back in our story, Hagar. She has fled because of the cruelty of Sarah. Now, it would be easy here just to um, say, Sarah, you're a bad woman. But Hagar was a servant. And she began to show contempt to Sarah. And perhaps it was because it was her expectation that her son is the firstborn. Her son will inherit. She hasn't understood that God has given to Abraham a promise that his son, his son through his wife, Sarah, will be the child that carries the promise. And once Sarah conceives, and of course there's no longer any need of a son from Hagar, she casts Hagar out. And when Hagar runs away in Genesis 16, she's alone and she's broken. And it's at this point that the angel of the Lord enters the story. This is in fact the first time we encounter the angel of the Lord in, in the Bible. And to me, it's completely fascinating that it's not to Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, nor to Moses, the giver of the law, to whom this angel described as the angel of the Lord appears for the very first time and reveals himself. It's when Hagar meets with him. And so we need to take a look at who she says he is. And what's really interesting is the way that this angel speaks. So I'm going to pop over to the, the story in Genesis 16. And we'll read a little bit of it together because I think it helps us to read the story. So here in Genesis 16, verse seven, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him and he shall dwell over and against his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God of seeing. She calls him El Roi, for, tr for she said, truly have I seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well was called Ba'er Lachai Roi. It lies between Kadesh and Barad. And Hagar bore Abraham a son, and Abraham called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. So, what are we seeing in this encounter? Well, first of all, he's an angel. And in Hebrew, the word is malach, or malach. And it can also be translated as messenger. And it, this word can also not only refer to the divine messengers, but also to human messengers. And here though, we're dealing with something supernatural. We're dealing with perhaps, depending on your position, a pre-incarnate visitation of the Messiah Yeshua. 
Now, in the, the, the Old Testament, the precise identity of the angel of the Lord isn't given. But there are clues. And when we read the angel of the Lord, we know that this angel is being separated out from all other angels. This is someone special. Now, when we look at this particular story, we see that the angel of the Lord speaks to her with authority. He tells her what she must do, and that is return and submit to her mistress. And then he makes a prophecy or a promise. And listen to how it's written. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply you. In other words, what's really unique here is that the voice of the angel of the Lord speaks with the authority of God. Angels can bring a message from God, but they cannot speak with the authority of God. If we think of other instances where we see the angel of the Lord in scripture, I guess the first one that comes to mind is Moses. He sees the, or hears the voice of the angel of the Lord. And of course, in um, Exodus three verses two, we read the angel of the Lord appeared to him out of the fire in the midst of the bush. And look, and he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And then he's told you're to take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. It's important to kind of, I guess, build a picture and the Old Testament does that it, it you get little snippets here and there and it's like a puzzle that you build up what's really interesting is that in Exodus 23 verse 20 we have this said behold I send an angel before you to keep you in the way you are to go and to bring you to the place which I have prepared Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Now this angel noticed two things. He has the power to forgive sin. And secondly, his, the name of God is in him. He's a bearer of the name of the Lord. And the name of the Lord, of course, is the yod heh vav -He -Nay, name that God gave to himself or revealed about himself when he met Moses at the burning bush. I am that I am, or I will be who I will be. Now, what's interesting is that she called the name of the Lord, this is back in, with um, Hagar, so she's heard the voice of God. She's heard him speak with authority. And so she now makes a declaration. She called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God who sees. So in Hebrew, she's calling him El Roi. You know, it's interesting that she understands, now she's a pagan, she's an Egyptian. I'm not sure Abraham even knows enough about God to, to teach his servants and his slaves about God. He only knows what God has asked of him to do. He only knows what he is willing to do in following God. 
but he hasn't yet had loads of revelation. He hasn't yet really learned who God is. And there's a story within a story here. And we'll see that. And it, I was quite struck by it. And I'll share that with you in a few minutes. Let's just move on, I think. Let me go back to my other notes. There we go. So, she's called the name of God, the Lord. You are a God of seeing. You are El Roi. And it's interesting because she has a number of firsts. Hagar meets the angel of the Lord first. She gives the angel of the Lord a name. And in fact, not only is she the first person to meet the angel of the Lord, she's the first person who gives the angel of the Lord a name. In fact, I think she might be the only person who gives the angel of the Lord a name. Even Abraham, when he's on the mountain, he calls the name of the place. He doesn't speak to the voice from heaven. He doesn't speak to the angelic presence. He kind of, it's almost like he's saying it in the third person. Hagar, who knows nothing, who's been met by the angel of the Lord, speaks to him directly. She's the, really the first woman in scripture who has a powerful revelation of who God is. And if we believe kind of some of the stuff I've been talking about here, then she's had a theophany, an encounter with God. Or has she had an encounter with the pre-incarnate Messiah? Or has she simply met an angel? It's one of the three, that's for sure. And you'll find out what I believe as we go through. You know, the text itself identifies this angel, this Malach, as being the angel of the Lord. But who is he? It's a bit of a biblical conundrum. But John makes something clear in his prologue. Let's read John 1 verse 18. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's right side, has made him known. God cannot be seen, but his son can. And ultimately, that is the work that the Son of God came to do. Here in John's Gospel, there is a declaration. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. I think if you've never read any scripture before, that really doesn't make sense. But we know that John has already said that the word in the beginning was the word meaning Jesus, Yeshua. And the word was with God and the word was God. We know that as you go through, we've done it together, the I am sayings. Um, basically, when uh, Jesus, Yeshua says, before Abraham was, I am, he would have said it in Hebrew. And the people would have heard him use the very same name that God had given himself at the burning bush. In other words, what Yeshua was saying is all that the father is, I am. And so this is why it's not such a big conundrum when John can say, no one has ever seen God except the only God who is seated at the Father's side. This God has made God known. Again, it's a bit of a 
a mouthful, a bit of a, I guess, conundrum is, or a riddle. But if you understand that the purpose of the coming of Yeshua, of Jesus, is to make known the Father, if we accept that his words, that he and the Father are one, to see him is to see the Father. And so we could actually say that this first appearance of the angel of the Lord is something completely and utterly remarkable. Because God has in some way manifested himself, not to, as I said, Abraham or to uh, Moses, but to a slave woman, an Egyptian. And so she's able to see who he is, the God who sees. And I, I, I saw a teaching recently on this story and the way in which the verb to see is a key for unlocking uh, the story and you can see all these different who saw what and when they saw what and what did it mean that they'd seen this and it was really quite fascinating but she has seen the god who has seen her she has seen the god who sees all things now her revelation is both profoundly prophetic and i guess marvelous because she says something that points us directly to Yeshua. And it's in the naming of the well in honor of the visitation. And she called the name of the well Ba'er Lachai Roi. And one of the best translations of that might be a well to the living one who sees me. She recognizes that he is this angel that she's seen, the angel of the Lord, the living one, the eternal one, who exists in all generations, the one whose word brings revelation, the one who has the power to make and fulfill promises, the one who has the authority to speak for God. And I remember the very first time I looked at this, it was, I was in um, Finland and I was asked to do a series of talks on supernatural encounters with people in the Old Testament. And Hagar was one of the ones I did. And it struck me that this title, The Living One, belongs to God belongs to Yeshua, Jesus himself. In fact, in Revelation 1, verses 17 to 18, John has his encounter with the Messiah, Jesus. And this is what happens. And I saw him and I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying to me, do not fear. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Now, the angels also ask a question that reveals that they too knew what is true about Yeshua. And of course, one of the, the methods that the New Testament uses to express the deity of Messiah is to take the titles of God and give them to, to Jesus. So in Luke 24, verse 5, when the angels uh, turn up, they ask a question. And this is just after they had come to the burial place of Messiah 
and they wanted to bring the spices they had prepared. And in verse 5, we read, they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, it's the angels, why do you seek the living among the dead? Now, they weren't seeking more than one living person. He's, the angels are specifically talking about the resurrection of the Messiah. And so seeking the living among the dead sounds really nice in English. It's nice and poetic. But actually, it might be better to say, why do you seek the living one among the dead? Because they're not seeking for anyone other than the Savior. And the angels answer, he is not here. He has risen. And of course, just like um, Hagar is told not to be afraid, so too are the women who come to meet and to minister to the body of Yeshua, of Jesus, except he had risen from the dead. So, it, it's quite interesting. I find, I, actually, I find the whole of this completely fascinating. In, Corinth, in Colossians 2.9, we read that in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Um, that's the, the old King James Version. In the ESV, the, the modern uh, English Standard Version, it says, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And Yeshua's own testimony is this, in Luke 24, 44. Sorry. And he said to them, these are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms might be fulfilled. I believe that she's had an encounter with not just the living God, but the pre-incarnate Yeshua. In Colossians we read, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones and dominions or rulers or authorities all things were created through him and for him. And I remember looking up just today the title, uh, Living God. And it surprises me, or doesn't surprise me, that we find this title belonging to the Lord. So there are a number of verses. In Deuteronomy 5, verse 6, I love this. For who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire and has still lived? Well, we could say that of Moses. But we could also say that of the people of Israel because they stood at the foot of that mountain and the whole mountain was on fire and the voice of God spoke. The psalmist um, talks about his heart singing for joy to the living God, of his soul thirsting for the living God. And so this title, Living God, clearly belongs to God the Father. Listen to Jeremiah 10.10. 10. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. So when we end up in Revelation chapter one, this title, living God, is now being given to Yeshua, to Jesus. The angels called him by that name. And what's really interesting is, um, that the Targums, and we've mentioned these before, 
These are ancient scriptures that contain interpretive understandings um, in Aramaic of the Old Testament. Targum Jonathan says, Wherefore she called the well, the well at which the living eternal one was revealed. She'd had an encounter with the living eternal one. The one she called the God who sees. Of course, I believe that these encounters with the angel of the Lord are the pre-incarnate Yeshua. And that's the reason why the angel of the Lord doesn't appear in the New Testament. Because Yeshua has come in the fullness of his person, fully man. But he comes in the Old Testament to make God known. So if we move on from this, because I could, we could stay there all day and talk about the angel of the Lord. But let's move on and ask how Paul's use of Hagar and Sarah, um, what the purpose of that is in Galatians 4. And ask why on earth does he use Hagar as a paradigm or an allegory to try and understand a spiritual truth? So Galatians 4. Before I do that, I'm going to tell you, share something that really helped me understand the story. It also helped me understand what Paul was doing. And remember I said there's a story within a story. Hagar's story is still the story of Israel. Think about Moses. How does Moses meet God and where does Moses meet God? Well, he's in the wilderness at a burning bush. What about Hagar? Where does she meet God? She meets God in the wilderness at a well. And God but promises both to Abraham and Sarah that their sons will be a great nation. And God promises Hagar that her son will be a great nation as well. And yes, Hagar's story is the story of the exile. It's a very personal pastoral story where we can see the tenderness and the mercy and the loving kindness of God reaching into her pain, into her struggle and comforting her. But what's so interesting is you have this parallel. Hagar's son is born in slavery. Sarah's son is born in freedom. And so Paul is using these two stories like that mirror each other to teach them a really important truth. First of all, he says the son born in slavery is Hagar's son. And he likens that to the current city of Jerusalem as that spiritual mother. And he says that that is the law of Moses. And then he talks about the son that is born in freedom to Sarah. And Paul likens Sarah here to the heavenly city of Jerusalem, the mother of all. Ishmael becomes a son according to the flesh. But Isaac is a son according to the promise. And Paul is dealing with a problem in Corinth, in uh, the church in, in Galatians. And the problem is that they've got two factions. And one of the factions are those who believe that you can only come to faith in the Messiah if you come through the Torah to him. That you keep the Torah as well. Now, don't forget Rav Shul never stopped keeping the Torah. He was always obedient to the law. However, his relationship to the law has changed. 
And I think the key to understanding Galatians chapter uh, 4 is found in verse 7. You are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir through God. So what he's saying is, if you continue to look for salvation based in the law, you are a slave. But if you choose to come to Jesus, to Yeshua, and come through the child of promise, the one who will be born, in verse 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. So we actually have three women in the story. But this son, if we come to this place, we're an heir through God. Now, there is something else going on here behind the text um, that uh, had particular points at which if you're a child, if you are a minor, if you're not yet accepted, then you, as a man, you have no rights as an heir. Okay, that's an interesting one. So there's something else going on here behind the story, behind these words. If you're going to be a son with legal rights, you have to become a son of the promise. You have to become a child of the new covenant. So it's, it's, it's one of those um, things where we have this challenge. You see, Isaac is the son born of promise. And we know that, you know, in, in Romans, that if you were a spiritual child of Abraham, it means you've come through faith in Yeshua. And that the physical children of Abraham in order to enter into the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the Jerusalem on high, the city whose architect and builder is God, the city where Abraham was searching for, the city that he'd set his hope on. If you want to be part of the new heavenly Jerusalem, then you have to come through the Messiah, Yeshua. Now, Paul was never against the Torah but he was always against the Torah as your means of righteousness. And so he's trying to teach them that there, you can be a Jew who lives as a child of the covenant, but you have to understand that salvation is by grace. It comes through faith in the promise, not through the keeping of the requirements of the law. In fact, Paul in, Gala in Romans tells us that what the law does is it exposes our sinfulness. And I think that the purpose of the law was twofold. It reveals God's glory and his holiness. It, was see it, it reveals man's sinfulness. And then you're at a, a, um, a crossroads. What are you going to do? Because you can't keep it. And if you can't keep it, you're stuck. And if God has removed the temple and the sacrificial system, how are you going to be made righteous? Where is the sacrifice? There is none. And what Paul has been saying in this is that the law was put in charge to lead us so that we would find faith in God. And what's so amazing is that the children of promise are those who are both children of physical descent and children not. Verse 8, 
Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by their nature are not gods. But now you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God. So how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? Whose slaves you want to be once more. And so what he really wants them to see in using the example of Hagar and Sarah is that we are brothers and sisters like Isaac, verse 28. You brothers, and we'll include the sisters, like Isaac are children of the promise. Because just at the right time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, as it is now. So I just want to encourage you that it's the story within the story that is behind the teaching here. And understanding that helps us to unpack what Paul is saying. And, you know, I think for me, as a Jewish believer in Yeshua, belonging to the Abrahamic covenant is important. It identifies me as a physical descendant of Abraham. But only through faith in Yeshua, in Jesus, can I be a spiritual descendant of Abraham and enter into the kingdom of God through the new covenant made in Yeshua. It's understanding who we are. Paul sp spoke in, Cor in Corinthians and he said, you know, if you come, when you come to faith as the circumcised continue to live as the circumcised, if you come to faith as the uncircumcised, do not begin to live as the circumcised. In other words, be content with who God made you. And know that, there, that, that when we come through the new covenant, there's a level playing field. We're all children of promise. We all share the same spiritual father and mother in Abraham and Sarah. And we are all welcomed in through the new covenant on the basis of faith, on the basis of grace, not by works so that we can boast, but based on the grace and the free gift that Jesus, Yeshua, gave for us. I think that's probably where I should end tonight because we're running well past time. Thank you for your patience in listening and I hope this has been helpful.